Why don't we start with Israel? Obviously, you've been doing extraordinary work. What's the big takeaway from having spent that much time on the ground in the area in a place where the media basically won't go and seem to just take the propaganda at face value? I think it's lots of things. Um, I mean, the first is that what Israel is in now is a situation that a lot of countries have been in historically, if not most at some point. I, I say that it, it's, it's, to go from the zone of peace into the zone of war is probably the biggest zone change anyone will ever go through. Tolstoy describes it in War and Peace, the moment that before the battle begins and the moment of the battle, everything is different. And, you know, before October 7th, Israel was relatively at peace. I, I, one of the reasons I wanted to go there very soon after was I already thought that it was quite likely, actually, that most people wouldn't focus on what had happened and wouldn't even find out much about what had happened. Uh, as you know, the, the, the standard thing that always happens with Israel is... Uh, Israel is attacked by rockets or whatever. Israel attacks back, and the world's headlines are Israel attacks Gaza. You know, that's, that's the norm. I've seen that in every conflict that I've covered there since 2006. And um, so I thought it was important to sort of not lose sight of the 7th and what had happened. And in the outside world, I mean, in Israel, almost everyone knows the stories of the day, the horrors and the heroism. But it was an attempt to go all the way up through the country. It was, a, it, was a, it was the most serious invasion that Israel has suffered. And uh, the country, as a result, was put into a state of war, not of its own choosing, but uh, as I've often said in recent months, you know, there's, if you start a war, as Hamas did, then um, you should expect to have war. And that's what Hamas has had in the months since. And I think most of the world is wildly, wildly ignorant of what is going on because they don't care about the details. Or in the case of the media, they don't have the details. Everybody, everybody in the Western media talks about what's happening in Gaza. Some of the media, I've, I've been into Gaza with Western media uh, um, as well as others. And, um, and they, so they, they have been in, but mainly people rely, as you know, just on stringers or on local journalists. And they just report what they say. And there are just basic media standards that have completely fallen away. I mean, <laughs> the, the sort of expectations that the world has placed on Israel middle of this conflict are unprecedented in any conflict I've ever seen in my lifetime uh, or anyone that I can even think of. The idea that in the middle of a war, it is your job to resupply the civilian population of the enemy that sympathizes with and provides cover for the army that you are, that you are fighting that it's not only your job to go house to house, it is, it is your job to sacrifice your own soldiers mm -hmm. in order to protect civilians who are being used as human shields by the opposition. And then, if a mistake is made in an urban combat environment with, by the way, the, the single best terrorist to civilian kill ratio in the history of urban warfare, mm -hmm. that somehow that's it, it's Israel's fault, it's Israel's problem. Where do you think that sort of double standard is coming from? I think that it's that a significant amount of people in the West have been educated, miseducated, in the idea that to some, to, in some way Israel is and always is the aggressor. Israel has done something wrong, and anything that is done in response to the something wrong can kind of be excused. And I hate that. Yeah, I've remarked many times that the problem with this is not a problem for Israel as much as it is a problem for the West. That, that Israel, if you visit, it's actually, despite all of the internal divisions, and there are many, a pretty cohesive society that actually would like to live, actually has no death wish in the way that the West seems to have a peculiar death wish, not reproducing, not having babies. Israel is the only Western country that has above replacement rates of birth. The fertility rate in Israel is above three, and that's including areas like Tel Aviv, which is like San Francisco, yeah. socially, and every woman there is married and has three babies. Yeah. And so it's, it's really not a problem for Israel internally. It is a problem for the West because it seems to me that what's been happening in Israel is a manifestation of a broader philosophy that has taken over huge swaths of the left. I want to get to right-wing anti-Semitism and the problems there in a second. But on the left, which is really where it's predominant these days, the, the basic philosophy goes something like this. The world is made up of victims and it's made up of victimizers. Yes. And if you're on the ledger of victims, you're, you're uh, on the ledger of victims, not because you yourself have been victimized as an individual, it's because you're a member of a quote-unquote victimized group. That's and right. the way we can tell that you're a member of a victimized group is because your group is disproportionately unsuccessful mm -hmm. in some measurable way. You're economically unsuccessful, socially unsuccessful. And this means that you must have been victimized 
by somebody else, particularly a member of a victimizer group. Mm -hmm. and, and the real problem that you have when it comes to the Jews, particularly, is that the Jews happen to be historically victimized and also disproportionately successful. So they tend to blow up the entire structure of this thought. And so the Jews must then be recast into the okay. victimizers in order to People say, well, why are you so bothered about Israel? What is this small state? Why, is, why does it bother you? Western civilization is based on the legacy of Athens and Jerusalem. Um, Athens is under great assault always, but it's not actually under existential assault at the moment. What is being attempted by Israel's enemies is the a philosophical and cultural equivalent of burning all the libraries of Alexandria. This is one of the underpinnings of Western civilization, utterly, utterly at risk. And not in a sort of metaphorical way where people might use it as a sort of book subtitle, but a, the real thing. That's the, the, that's the other thing is, is what people don't realize is that they're all next. I'm always baffled by the fact that people don't believe the words that come out of people's mouths. Um, the Hamas leadership, the Hezbollah leadership, the leadership in Tehran, the revolutionary Islamic government, have all made perfectly clear what they want to do with Israel. But they don't regard Israel as being the main problem. They regard it as being the main regional problem for them and their expansionist Islamist worldview. But it's America that's their biggest enemy. That's why they call America the big Satan and Israel the little Satan. And as I always say, my country of birth is a rather sweet middle-sized Satan. <laughs> uh, a teenage Satan um, <laughs> with growing pains. Um, but, you know, it, 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 there's a reason they think that. There's a, and there's, uh, there's another way of doing it, which is it, it, here at home. Why is it you can, you can, you, you can make the following prediction with 100% accuracy? If there is a pro-Israel demonstration in America, or in Britain, or in Paris, uh, there will be flying of the Israeli flag, and there will be the flying of the flag of the United States of America, or of Great Britain, or France. If uh, uh, recently I was speaking at an event in uh, in uh, Montreal, and uh, you know it was it was a, it, uh, about a thousand Jews and about a thousand Christians and. It was in a synagogue, and it was a wonderful, wonderful evening. And, uh, you know, everyone sang O Canada and Hatikva. And, but why can you, why can you predict with 100% accuracy that the pro-Palestinian, not to mention pro-Hamas, demonstrators will never in America carry an American flag? Why do we know with 100% accuracy that when 100,000 mainly Muslim demonstrators go through the streets of London on a Saturday, they will not finish the demonstration by singing God Save the King? Why do I know that with 100% accuracy? Because it's not about Israel. It's about America. It's about Britain. It's about France. They hate Israel first, and it's the easiest one to hate. But they hate everybody else next year. This is a revolutionary movement, and it finds its first and most fevered and most flattered um, version in its attack on Israel. But of course it's anti-American, of course it's anti-Western, of course it's anti-British and anti-European.